we'll get a few more people from longer in, but uh, maybe that will happen. So let's go ahead and move on to our next speaker, John R. Blegg. He is an MA student in the History Department at Virginia Tech in Blacksburg, Virginia. His work centers on the memory of the U.S. Dakota War as well as the ways that conflict intersects with the American Civil War. His thesis and ethno and cultural history of indigenous space place building examines how the Dakota's culture, cultural place provides a space for Dakota to return to, remember, and decolonize white victimhood narratives. John holds a BA in history from Middle Georgia State University and is working on a public history certificate in conjunction with his MA. So let's uh, welcome John Lay. Hello, everybody. Can everybody hear me okay? Uh, thanks for coming out. I feel extremely honored to be here to present to everybody today. I feel like that's a little loud. Uh, uh, two years ago, I came and visited this museum in this very building, so uh, I'm extremely grateful to be here presenting to you today. Now, if you've sat with us today listening to all the emerging scholars, uh, they spent a lot of time on the East, whether that's the Eastern Theater, the Western Theater, the Trans-Mississippi Theater. I'm going to focus today on the frontier out in the West in Minnesota. Before I get started, I'd like to get some participation by the audience and ask, uh, what does everybody think about the terms total war and if you've heard of the term hard war tactics? Isn't that World War I? Sherman. Sherman. Generally, that's what we think about total war being, you know, seen in World War I, you know, this mass cataclysmic drama of World War I or World War II. We think of things like Sherman's March to the Sea, uh, famous image here. Uh, we think of Gone with the Wind, uh, the burning of Atlanta, this big drama. We think of things like the burning of the Shenandoah Valley by Philip, Philip Sheridan. Um, but I'd like us to think, as I go through this presentation, uh, the idea behind total war, not total war itself. Um, historians have been debating this for the longest time, and they have argued the Civil War was not a total war because, one, like Mark Neely suggests, there was an aircraft, or two, it's not World War I, it's not that size, it's not a modern war. But think about the ideas that go behind total war, and this idea of annihilation. And what I've studied is, uh, I'll start with this slide. I studied the Dakota War, which is a short-lived conflict in south-central Minnesota uh, during 1862 uh, between Dakota Indians, white settlers, and the U.S. Army. The war started uh, after broken treaty promises from the 1850s where the Dakota relinquished their lands to the federal government for the sum of upwards of $500,000. And at the point of these treaties being signed, the Dakota were placed onto reservations, the Upper and Lower Sioux Agency, along the Minnesota River Valley. These lands uh, had poor ground for farming, a lot of the fishing was inadequate, and the bison meat that they relied on was being pushed away by the white settlers seeking uh, more fur options and the such. Um, so in August 1862, the Dakota people were on the brink of starvation. And one of the most prominent quotes from the Dakota War comes from Andrew Meyer, who is a uh, trader and merchant. Uh, and he said to one of the Indian agents, who's like this person that brokers deals between Dakota and the federal government, so far as I am concerned, if they are hungry, let them eat their own grass or dung. So you really get a sense before the Dakota War even starts that white people just hate the Dakota people. They want them gone, they want their land, they don't want to worry about them. So the next six weeks, harsh fighting takes place in the Minnesota River Valley. Hundreds die, landscapes are destroyed, and what happens is 303 Dakota people um, and some other indigenous people that were placed into this group were sentenced to death, and that's a long, complicated story. 
what happens is a week before Abraham Lincoln signs the Emancipation Proclamation, he lowers that number to the worst of the worst, 38. So on December 26, 1862, 38 Dakota men are hanged from the singular gallows structure in the town square of Mankato, Minnesota, and what would be known as the largest mass execution in United States history. What happens after this is the Dakota are displaced, uh, some uh, women, children, and elderly are put into concentration camps at places like Mankato or Fort Snelling, which is in St. Paul. Uh, the men are placed in prisoner of war camps at places like Camp McClellan in Davenport, Iowa. And those who were not apprehended fled west into Dakota Territory and north into Manitoba. What I'm going to talk about today, though, is when we focus on this period, the six week long period that bled into November, December 1862. We lose an entire uh, campaign set up to eradicate, erase, and exterminate the Dakota people. In 1863 and 64, uh, Major General John Pope, which if you're familiar with the fighting here in Virginia, he loses the Second Battle of Bull Run, and he's sent out west to be the director of the Department of the Northwest. Uh, basically in charge to oversee this conflict with the Dakota people. John Pope orders two federal punitive expeditions under Henry Sibley up top, Alfred Sully below, to eradicate and exterminate the Dakota people. He says in one of his orders, it is my purpose utterly to exterminate the Sioux if I have the power to do so, and even if it becomes a campaign lasting the whole next year destroy everything belonging to them and force them out to the plains, unless, as I suggest, you can capture them. They are to be treated as maniacs or wild beasts, and by no means as people with whom treaties or compromises can be made. So in 1863 in particular, these two expeditions set up. You can see the dot. Sibley comes from Minnesota and he follows the Minnesota River into North Dakota, what would become North Dakota. Sully's men comes south and goes up the Missouri River into North Dakota. And what I'm going to focus on today is the Battle of Whitestone Hill, which is right here. It happens in September 1863. September 3rd, 1863, Albert E. House, the commander of the 6th Iowa Cavalry, is set out as a reconnaissance unit in front of Sully's main force, five miles behind them. Their goal to seek out the native population and engage in combat. House's forces approaching a small encampment realize the encampment is not small. There's between 300 and 600 teepees and over a thousand Native Americans. It's a mixture of Dakota people fleeing from Minnesota, but it's also uh, Lakota people and some others from the region outside of what we know as the Sioux Nation. House uh, gets closer. He sends some of his smaller uh, detachments to recon around uh, this encampment. Uh, and for the next two hours, a standoff ensues. In this time where there's no fighting taking place, some of the native elders decide they want to surrender. Uh, Major House decides that's not an option unless everybody surrenders. So at this point, he sends a dispatcher to make uh, General Sully to inform him of what they had found and the size of the force. And as this moment, this dispatcher is running off, some of the other natives get spooked and they decide to flee. Some decide to get prepared for battle. In one of the reports, it talks about some of the native men who didn't have time to uh, adorn themselves with war paint uh, went down to a small lake next to Whitestone Hill to cover themselves in mud to prepare for battle. Eventually, Sully's force, and by the way, there's no official map of this battle. I had to make it myself. This is the reason I'm a historian, not a map maker, so I apologize <laughs> for this poor looking map, but it gets the point across. When Sully's forces arrive, he sends House of Six Iowa Cavalry to the left. Furnace's second Nebraska cavalry to the right, and his main force of the rest of the 6th Iowa and 7th Iowa, as, much, as well as an uh, artillery battery up the center. Their goal is to push the natives to this ravine. There's no clear 
understanding how deep the ravine is, but it's to the point where the natives have their backs against this cliff. The goal is to circle them. As sun is setting, and this is into the third hour of this conflict, Furnace's men begin to attack. Furnace says in his general order, general report, when within 400 yards, I ordered my men to dismount and after advancing 100 yards nearer, ordered the second battalion to open the battle by a volley from their end fields, which they did with precision and effect, creating quite a confusion in the enemy's ranks. Let me just add here that they're combining a bunch of people into this word enemy. It's not only a military force they're fighting, but there's women, children of all ages, and elderly people who are just not fighting. They're simply trying to flee for their lives. So, Furnace's man begins to engage the native people, and like falling dominoes, the rest of the U.S. force attacks. As the sun sets and it's dark, the ravine fills with smoke and gunpowder, and the U.S. soldiers start shooting each other. There's this friendly fire going on. And when Sully realizes this, he pulls his forces back to Whitestone Hill. See down here, it's basically this around here. It wouldn't be until the next morning until the U.S. soldiers realized all the damage they had done. The U.S. force woke up and there was between 150 and 300 native people dead in the ravine and around the village. This is the same amount as we see in places like Sand Creek or the Bear River Massacre, but for some reason this amount is not known about. But the real devastation comes from, uh, I'm sorry, not the real devastation, the continued devastation uh, goes into this next day when Sully decides he wants to destroy all of the supplies and landscape in which these uh, native peoples lived and survived on. This is from F.E. Caldwell, the second Nebraska Cavalry. He says, Sully ordered all the property destroyed, teepees, buffalo skins, and all of their things, including tons and tons of dried buffalo meat and tallow. It was gathered in wagons, piled in a hollow and burned, and the melted tallow ran down the valley and the stream. Hatchets, and pedals, and all the things that would sink were thrown into a small lake. Now just to uh, tell you how, how big of a thing this was, there was between 400 and 500,000 pounds of dried bison meat burned that day. In one of the uh, soldiers' reports, it took a team of over 100 soldiers two full days to burn all of this meat. For the rest of the day, the soldiers were taking care of some of the wounded. They were burying their dead bodies. They were burying the Union, or the U.S. soldiers' bodies, but they burned all of the natives. Their remains were sprinkled on top of the soldiers' graves as a way to protect the fallen U.S. soldiers from the natives, quote, despoiling the final resting place of their soldiers. Sully wrote to John Pope immediately after the battle, saying that he gave the native contingent one of the most severe punishments that the Indians had ever received. And on October 5th, Pope wrote back a month later, The results are entirely satisfactory, and I doubt not that the effect upon the Northwestern Indians will be, as you report, of the highest consequence. I bear willing testimony to the distinguished conduct of yourself and your command. I'd like to just step away for a second and point out these two words, distinguished conduct. This really gets into this idea of uh, these hard war tactics. Um, people like Mark, Mark Grimsley have talked about this in his book, Hard Hand of War, uh, this idea of restraint, and the restraint used against Confederate soldiers. Uh, it was civilized warfare. And you definitely see in instance like this, or at Sand Creek or the Bear River, there is no restraint. And it's really interesting to hear the officer say that this is distinguished conduct. Here's an image of Whitestone Hill from the top, and you can see today what this ravine looks like. Now, that's the battle. 150 to 300 native people died. Some escaped. 
the U.S. government and army took control of this land from the native people. So I'd like to talk just for a few more minutes on the tactics used against native people. Uh, in Aaron Sheehan Dean's new book, Calculus of Violence, How Americans Fought the Civil War, he talks about two terms, logistical devastation and personal attrition. Logistical devastation being the destruction of supplies for some larger goals, winning a fight over an enemy, or personal attrition, this idea of like specifically targeting a civilian population. Uh, Actually, a few weeks ago, Aaron Sheehan came to Virginia Tech and gave a talk, and he said that the Civil War was mostly a war of logistical devastation. You don't see Sherman or Sheridan targeting civilian populations. They were not exterminating these white Southern people. But I'd like to argue, when looking at events like this in the same period in the West, it was both. It was both logistical devastation and personal attrition. Top White Sound Hill, there's a monument. You can see where the Union soldiers are buried. Um, so, when thinking about the Civil War in the West, we get a broader understanding that the Civil War was more than a war for emancipation. It was more than a war for reunion, but it was a war for expansion and imperialism. We look at the U.S. motives and moving west, we look at these conflicts that were once framed as conflicts defending white settlers. But you see incidents like Whitestone Hill in particular where they're set up to annihilate the whole community, the whole people. Um, this war was more for expansion west. And people right now are working on this, uh, people like Ari Kelman, Megan Kate Nelson, uh, Susanna Lee, they're all arguing this and I think uh, with this topic, we need to include the Dakota War into this conversation. Yeah, I guess that's it. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yeah, so any questions? Do you have any remorse after the mass hangings given in you know, the territory and oftentimes you show mercy to people who are going to be hanged? So after that, it's a great question. I'm not too sure on that. I do know that he's revered for lowering, lowering this number from like 303, or initially it was actually 393, down to 38. He's seen as like, oh, he's saving lives. But in reality, and especially if you talk to Dakota people, they still feel like this was a form of genocide and, and mass killing. And it's really interesting when you compare it to like literally a week later, he signed some emancipation proclamation set up to uh, free enslaved people. How many, how many survived? Uh, this battle? Or the, yeah. Uh, there's no clear number. Uh, during the battle, uh, let me go back to the map. During the battle, Furnace's troops, oh, I'm sorry. The 7th Cavalry, they were the one unit that did not dismount. So they were still on their horses. And during the heat of battle, their horses were spooked and they were kind of going crazy. And so they'd opened a gap in the line and several of the military age men escaped to fight another day. But there's no report on exactly how many. Are uh, these the same tribes that moved up to the uh, plains and fought in Sioux Wars and after? Yeah. So, uh, I'd like to argue too that these like Sioux Wars, the Indian Wars of the West, it starts in Minnesota with this war against the Dakota. Because these Dakota people that aren't put into the camps or reservations, they're fleeing west and they're joining Lakota communities. And these Lakota people are the same that are, you know, little big horn, wounded knee, that like. So I'd like to, to argue that this is the start of the yeah, So specifically Union soldiers say in the East looking at these events in the West? Yeah. I'm not too sure on that. Um, I'm thinking of Sand Creek 
Ari Kelman's book, The Misplaced Massacre, he talks about how the war from the East looked a lot different than the war from the West. And it's this like conduct that initially was like, wow, this is highly praised, you know, you defeated these savage people. Um, but in reality, people started to realize, no, it's not that great. So, I mean, that's a good point I'll have to check in.